Hello there, David Chadwick here again from Tactic Studios. Hey, welcome to tutorial number five in our series of seven introductory tutorials on the use of the default game engine. Hey, we have a pretty good one here today. This is going to be focused on the default physics engine. Uh, that's the capability that would allow you to have gravity pull down a uh, character in your game down towards the bottom, or perhaps you have two characters that want to bounce off of each other and you want that bounce effect. So uh, hey, this is a pretty critical capability, uh, one I think you're going to really enjoy learning about. So without uh, further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the trench. Before we begin, let's take a quick benchmark of where we are. Uh, as we've explained before, there's a total of seven tutorials in this introductory series, and we're now on tutorial number five. Hey, hey, that's great. Uh, when we finish our physics engine tutorial, we're gonna have two to go, and then you'll have a full toolkit that allows you to really begin building some really amazing games using this great engine called Default. Always helpful to look ahead to see what that end product might look like. This is what tutorial five is going to produce. Two moving platforms, the ability to spawn a square or a triangular shaped crate by touching the screen or potentially clicking the mouse. The crate is subject to gravity, so it falls towards the bottom. If it hits something, it bounces. And finally, when it hits the floor at the bottom, it's deleted and an explosion occurs. All right, let's step this for a second to the whiteboard. Uh, so what are we going to learn today? Uh, the real objective of the day is the physics engine, and the tool that we're really going to use to invoke that is something called the dynamic collision object. You know, we already did the kinematic collision object in uh, the drag and drop tutorial, uh, and you controlled all the movement of a game object really with your uh, Lewis script. Uh, with the dynamic collision object, it's going to be the physics engine that controls its movement, whether it be gravity pulling it down or bounce effect or the forces of friction, things such as that. So uh, that's really the real crux of what we're going to focus on today. But now that we're going to be bouncing things around, we want to make sure that our characters, our game objects, stay within the game world. So we're going to learn the concept of establishing a boundary. We're going to put a boundary on the left and a boundary on the right, something across the floor, so that as things bounce around, they stay inside the game world as long as we want them to. Uh, we're going to have multiple factories in this particular tutorial. Uh, we've had single factories, I think, in the past. Uh, we're going to have two for creating different shapes of uh, wooden crates, and wooden crates are going to be spawned and fall down towards the floor. And then we're also going to have a factory associated with creating a game object that has an explosion effect. If, if a crate finally hits the floor, eh, we're going to have a little explosion. Put a, put a little animation in there for us. So we're going to learn how to take the messaging capability and use that to invoke an animation called play animation in a different game object or in a different game component. Lastly, as you create multiple game objects and uh, you don't need them anymore, you want the ability to delete them. So uh, a quick aside is we're going to learn how to apply the, the geo delete function, which allows you to delete a game object. Before we get into the details of the design, just let's define a couple terms. Um, three are probably the critical ones, as you see on this uh, illustration here. Um, we have crates. Uh, those are the actual game objects that we're going to spawn and have them fall. Uh, we have the platforms. Those are the obstacles, if you will, that the crate has to either fall through or bounce over. And then we have the floor, and that's the basically the target destination for the crate. A quick overview of the design. Uh, we have a total of 10 game objects built within a single main dot collection. Um, although there's 10, they really fall into four categories. We have stationary game objects. That would be the background. That would be the left and right boundaries. And uh, that would be the floor. Uh, we have factory-based um, game objects. They host a factory. Uh, we have three of those, one for creating a crate, a square crate, one for creating the triangular crate, and one for creating the explosions. Uh, we have two game objects, one for the left and one for the right platform that's going to move back and forth. And finally, we have a game object for the cursor. Well, as we've said, no plan, no build. Uh, we're going to use a six-phased approach on this particular tutorial. Um, I think they follow the design pattern pretty closely. 
Uh, we'll start with our initial project setup. You've done that uh, several times before. Uh, shouldn't have any surprises there in terms of the game.project file and the uh, input bindings and setting up an image file and creating an atlas. And I've also put building that background game object in there uh, just to kind of finalize the setup. Uh, next, we're going to build some game objects associated with the boundaries of the game and the moving platforms associated with the game. Uh, in the third phase, we're going to add a crate spawning phase so that uh, we have the ability to generate a square-based uh, wooden crate. Um, in the fourth phase, uh, we're actually going to create the cursor object. And the cursor object will allow us to actually pick the location that we want to spawn that crate in. Uh, we'll extend that in uh, phase five uh, by uh, putting an explosion effect when the crate falls down the screen, gets past those uh, platforms and hits the floor, there'll be a little explosion effect and then we'll delete the game object so it doesn't eat up memory space on us. And lastly, we want to talk a little bit about what do you do when the character that you're building, um, you need a collision object for it, but it doesn't quite clearly fit into either a box or a sphere shape. How do you add a shape that's uh, for something a little bit more complicated? Um, and that's called a convex collision object shape, and we'll uh, illustrate that by having a triangular shape to create and how we use vertices to describe that. For this plan, we're going to have sequential builds. We're going to have four of them starting in uh, phase three, uh, so that'll be build one all the way through phase six, which would be build four, and that'll allow us to check for errors and just to check functionality to make sure everything's working as we originally designed it to be. Phase one is our initial project setup. Uh, you should be really familiar with this. So uh, go ahead and start with an empty template. Uh, give it the name you'd like. I've called mine uh, Tutorial 5 uh, Physics and uh, save it to your desktop. Uh, in this phase, we're going to modify a couple parameters inside the game.project file. We're going to verify input bindings. Um, then we're going to add our, Im our folder, uh, put our images in it, create our atlas from that. And then uh, we'll create a simple background object as a basis for the game. Kicking off this initial project setup, let's first modify the game.project parameters. Uh, the only thing we're going to change here is the screen size. I've decided to stay with that 1024 pixel width and 768 pixel height screen size. Uh, it continues to reflect that aspect ratio of 1.33, which I like because it complies with the iPad series of tablet devices. Okay, so next let's confirm the input bindings for the left mouse button. Go ahead, bring that into focus, and within the mouse triggers section, make sure there's a binding for mouse-button-1, and that should be associated with a touch action. Next, let's go ahead and load our images and build the project atlas. Create an images folder within the project master folder. Go ahead and drop and drag the images for this tutorial into that folder. Okay, then let's go ahead and construct an atlas. First, right click the main folder shown on the project panel, Project Explorer. Select New, select Atlas, and name that atlas Graphic Assets. Now double click the newly created atlas in order to put it into focus within the outline window. Go ahead and right click it and select add images. As a quick reminder, when adding images to a default atlas, there are two general categories we need to keep in mind. Uh, the first is standalone images similar to our background. They simply get plugged onto the screen and they're going to stay where they are. The second are images that are part of an animation group. In other words, more like a flip book. Let's add all the stationary image files first. There's a series of them. The first would be the paper background. Second would be the crate image. Uh, third would be the cursor image. And lastly would be the platform. Next, we're going to add an animation group to the Atlas, which would reflect an explosion effect. 
<laughs> Explosion. Sounds kind of interesting. Okay, let's go ahead, right-click Atlas, add an animation group. A new animation will appear at the bottom of the Atlas outline. Go ahead and change the name of it in the Properties window. I've changed mine to Explosion. I've also changed the frames per second, the FPS, for this animation to 10. That works uh, about right. Uh, I've also set the playback to once forward, since we're only going to want the animation to play once for each time the explosion occurs. Uh, at least for that sequence, it doesn't make sense to have the explosion repeat itself on a loop. You can now add the images uh, to this animation group by right-clicking Explosion, select Add Images, identify the frames related to the explosion, and go ahead and add them. As always, we want to avoid any edge bleeding where the edge pixels of one image bleed into a neighboring image. We're going to do this by setting the extrude borders value to 3. That will be done in the Atlas Properties window. And we're now ready to start adding game objects and game components to our project as we progress to step 2. Okay, the first action will be uh, adding the game object. Hey, adding a background is uh, pretty straightforward. I think you've pretty well got this one down, right? Double click uh, main dot collection in the project explorer, puts it into focus in the outline. Go ahead over to the right there on the outline window, right click collection and select add a new game object. In the properties window, let's rename this to be background. And we're also going to want to edit its position within the properties window to ensure that the background is centered within the game window. So let's set the X position to 512 and the Y position to 384. So for this project, I'm going to set the Z position to a negative 0.5. Hey, that's going to ensure that all the other game objects that we create, we can have a Z of 0, and they still remain on top of the background. Okay, finally, let's go ahead and again right-click Background, select Add Component, and select Sprite. That's going to allow us to add an image. So once the sprite's been added as a component to the background game object, again, within that property window, go ahead and select the graphic assets.atlas as the source for this image and paper underscore 1024 by 768 as the default animation using those drop down menu features on the property window. Okay, here we're in uh, phase two at this point. We're going to create the moving set of platforms and the boundaries. Uh, the moving platforms, uh, there'll be two game objects, one for the left, one for the right. In each case, they'll have a sprite with an image associated with it. They're going to have a kinematic collision object associated with each. And uh, they're going to have a, a Lua script associated with each. And we'll build that here in this phase. We're going to have left and right boundaries. They're going to consist solely of a kinematic collision object just to kind of keep the game objects bouncing back into the game world. And then we're going to create a floor that'll have a kinematic uh, collision object associated with it. Uh, no sprite, no image associated with that, nor with the side boundaries. On the floor, we are going to have a Lua script, mostly to capture the floor ID. That way we'll know when crates hit it that it hit the floor by hitting something else and we can take appropriate action. In this case, we're going to spawn a, an explosion. This build step is focused on constructing the two sides of the platform using two game objects, left platform and right platform. Let's go ahead and create the left platform. We use that as a starting point and then we're simply going to replicate it for the right with a couple minor changes. Uh, each of the platform game objects consists of three components. First is a sprite, which would include the image. The second is a collision object that's going to control the physics-based impacts of a crate colliding with the platform. And lastly, a script file to contain the required game logic. With main.collection and focus inside the outline window, let's go ahead and add a new game object to the project. Go ahead and right-click collection, select add game object. And in the properties window, let's name the game object as left platform. And now we can go to the Properties panel and set the following positions. Let's set the X position for the left platform to be 312 and the Y position to be 150. Now we're ready to add a sprite to the platform. Go ahead, add a sprite to the game object by right-clicking left platform, select Add Component, and select Sprite. And within the Properties window for this, identify the image resource graphic assets. That'll be its resource and select the default animation to be Platform 300. Let's now add a collision object to the platform. 
For this project, we're going to be using a kinematic type of platform since we don't want gravity to affect these platforms. The kinematic object will collide with the other physics objects, but the job of resolving those collisions or ignoring them is going to be solely up to us. And those kinematic objects are good when you need objects that collide and you want fine-grained control over all the reactions. Also, and important on this, is kinematic objects are not affected by gravity. To add the collision object to our platform game object, within the outline window with the main collection in focus, go ahead and right-click left platform, select add component, select collision object, and click on the newly created collision object and change its type to kinematic. To incorporate the shape for which collisions are to be determined, uh, a shape needs to be added to the collision object. We can do this by clicking collision object, selecting add shape, and for this case, let's select box. We're going to set the dimensions of this box within the properties window to reflect a width of 300 and a height of 20. We're now ready to create and add the Lua script that's going to control the platform. Within the Property Explorer, go ahead and create a new folder. It's going to contain all the script files, and let's change its name to Scripts Repository. Go ahead and right-click on that Scripts Repository folder, select New, and select Script. I've changed the name of the script to be Platform Left, And let's replace all that default script content when you open it up with the following. This script is pretty straightforward. It captures the exposition of the platform and uses that within a go.animate function to move the platform back and forth by 100 pixels in each direction. And it does that within a loop every five seconds. All right, we're now ready to add that script as a component file to the game object. The right platform game object is created using essentially the exact same approach that we just described for the left. However, its position is going to be different. For the right platform, the X position is going to be 712 and the Y position will be 150. I'm going to quickly go ahead and go through the entire right platform without narrative. Just follow along. You should be able to quickly be able to follow it. Now the procedure for creating the game floor is going to begin with adding a game object as normal and we're going to double click main dot collection within the explorer and place it into focus. Go ahead right click collection select add game object. 
hey, I've named this game object as floor boundary, since that's what it's going to be. And within the properties window, let's set the X position to 512, which will place it in the center of the bottom, and the Y position to minus 15. This will locate that game object centered right at the very bottom of the screen, right at the very edge. Hey, note that uh, we're not adding a sprite for this game object. We don't want to see it. We're just going to have a collision object and a Lua script. And then the outline window. Now let's add the collision object by right-clicking floor boundary and selecting add game component. Go ahead and select the collision object and within properties, select kinematic as the collision type. Go ahead and add a box shape to the collision object by right-clicking it, add shape, select box, and set the dimension properties for that box to 1024 pixels wide, that'd be the X, and 20 pixels high, that'd be the Y. Finally, we're gonna to need to add a short script to that floor, solely aimed at capturing that floor ID as a control variable. That control variable is going to be used as the basis for only deleting crates that hit the floor, but not the crates that hit the sides or hit the raised platform or hitting other crates. Go ahead and create the new script file within the scripts repository and name it Floor Actions. Replace the default code with the following. This script simply captures the ID of the floor, and we're going to use that to determine if a crate has collided with the floor as distinct from the collisions it might have with other game objects within the game. All right, we're now ready to add that script as a component file to the game object. Well, now that the floor is in place, let's go ahead to the left and right side. The process for adding these sides is also relatively simple. We're going to create uh, two game objects within the main collection, one for each side, and we're going to add a collision object to each using a box shape. They will not have a sprite, nor will they have a Lua script. Let's build the left game object first. Double-click main.collection within the Project Explorer. Let's going to place it in focus within the outline window. Go ahead, right-click collection, select add game object. And within the properties window, I've named the first of these games objects as left boundary. Within that same property window, go ahead and set the position for the left boundary game object as follows. Let's have the X position be a minus 10 and the Y position a 384. 3D4 will place it halfway up the height of the game window. Within the outline window, let's add a collision object by right-clicking left boundary, select add game component, select collision object, and in the property window, make sure you set that collision type to kinematic. No gravity associated with these uh, side uh, boundaries. We're going to add a box shape to the collision object by right-clicking on the collision object, select add shape, select box, and go ahead and set the dimensions of the box to a width uh, X of 20 and a height Y of 768. Okay, now let's add the companion game object for the right side. Go ahead, double click main dot collection, place it in focus. And again, within the outline window, right click collection, select add game object. And let's name this game object right boundary. Within the Properties window, set the position for the right boundary as a X position of 1034 and a Y position of 384. Again, there's no need for a sprite nor for a script on the right side, just as we did on the left. So let's go ahead and simply add the collision object. A right click left boundary in the uh, outline window, select Add Game Component, select Collision Object, Make sure you set that collision type to kinematic. And let's go ahead and add the box shape. Right click collision object, select add shape, select box. Set the dimensions of the box to uh, X of 20 and a Y of uh, 768. Okay, here in the third phase, we're actually gonna create a, uh, a square crate spawning action. 
Uh, so uh, we're going to start with building a prototype for that square crate. And in that prototype, obviously, we'll have a game object. We're going to have a sprite with an image associated with it. It's going to have a dynamic uh, collision object because we want that crate to be affected by gravity. And then it's going to have a Lua script to control its actions. Uh, and then we're going to create a factory hosting game object uh, that we'll be adding to our main collection. And that will have a factory that points back to the prototype that we've established. At the end of phase three, we're going to conduct our first build. It's not going to be very exciting. You'll simply see the platforms moving back and forth, but it'll give us a chance to kind of get a benchmark and make sure we have no errors. All right, let's go ahead and create the prototype for the wooden crate. To do this, we want to create a new game object uh, within the Project Explorer. So let's right click on the main folder, select new, select game object, Let's go ahead and name that object Crate Prototype. We're going to be adding three components to the Crate Prototype. A sprite, a collision object, and a Lua script. Let's start with the sprite. Let's add the sprite to the Crate Prototype. Go ahead and uh, gain focus on the new prototype within the outline window and right click Game Object and select Add Component, select Sprite. Let's go ahead and select the, the source for that sprite to be the graphic assets atlas that uh, drives the entire project. And the default animation is going to be obj underscore crate 002. Next, let's go ahead and uh, add the collision object. Uh, that's going to how we control the 2D physics, and that's going to directly impact this crate. Uh, so right click game object in the outline window, select add component. Select Collision Object and, and make sure you set the Type property to Dynamic. Yep, this one's a first. We're going to want our wooden crates to fall from wherever we place them. They're going to fall down due to the forces of gravity in that Y direction. Then we need to add a box shape to control how the collisions occur. Go ahead and right click Collision Object, select Add Shape, select Box, and set that box's dimensions to a width of 96 pixels and a height of 96 pixels. All right, lastly, let's add the Lua script to the crate prototype. Go ahead to the scripts repository folder and create a new script. And let's change the name of that to box script. Go ahead and replace the default Lua code with the following. In box script, a script property is initialized to false, which is a control variable used to prevent duplicate deletion actions on the same box crate. The update function captures the X and Y position of the crate and echoes those positions within a set of debug messages that are posted on the screen. When the onMessage function receives a collision response message, if the ID of the object it collided with is the floor, then it deletes the game object, unless the self-deleting script property is already true. That prevents duplicate deletions. Lastly, a counter is incremented to keep track of how many crates have hit the floor. And lastly, let's not forget to add that script as a component file to the crate prototype. Oh yeah, I sometimes do. And I catch it when I build and see that, hey, what's going on? None of my logic's being applied. Uh, first thing to look, always make sure you've added that script back as a component file. Once the crate prototype game object's been created, we need to add a controller. We need to add a controller as a game object, and that controller needs to include a factory, and that's how we're going to spawn the crates. So with main collection and focus, go ahead over to that outline window on the right, add a new game object, Let's name it Create Crates. And within this game object, let's add a factory object component. Uh, go ahead, you can retain the default ID of factory and set the prototype for that factory to the, what we had just created, the Crate Prototype Game Object. And this is where we'll spawn the new wooden crates using that factory component. Okay, let's go ahead and add a Lua script to create crates. So inside the Project Explorer, let's go to our scripts repository and create a new script. Let's call it Spawn Crates. 
and go ahead and replace the default Lua code with the following. Two global variables are declared in the init initialization function. They determine how many crates have been created and how many have hit the floor. Now go ahead, add that scripted component file to the create crates game object. Okay, if you haven't yet, go ahead and save your project. And it's now time for build one. Uh, we're going to do this uh, for a couple reasons. Let's ensure we have no errors. And let's observe the movement of our left and right platforms. Well, I told you, build one wasn't very exciting, was it? That's okay. Okay, let's build on that foundation. In phase four, we're going to add the cursor game object. You've done that before. Uh, it's going to be a simple game object. It's not going to have a sprite associated with it, but it will have a kinematic collision object. That way we'll know where the cursor physically is, what other uh, collision objects that it's touching. Uh, and we're going to have a script associated with it so that uh, we can capture those actions. At the end of creating the cursor game object, uh, we're going to do build two just to benchmark where we are. And from that point, we should be able to actually spawn a crate and observe that spawning action, verify that it's happening, and then watch gravity effects take control of that crate. This step is actually uh, pretty similar to what we did back in tutorial number three. Uh, we're going to add a cursor game object to the project that's going to include a kinematic collision object with a sphere shape. Uh, we're going to put a label next to that that will echo the current XY location on the screen, mostly for debugging purposes, as well as to illustrate how you use labels. And we're, then we're going to add a Lua script that will support all the needed game logic. With the main collection in focus, inside the outline window, go ahead and right-click Collection and select Add Game Object. And let's name the game object cursor within the properties window. Now let's add a collision object to cursor. Note that the collision type should be set to kinematic, aka uh, the cursor is going to collide with other objects, but all the logic related to that collision is going to be performed in our uh, script files. For this collision object down in the properties window, we want to set the collision object's group and mask to none. We don't want the cursor to be an object that the other game objects might hit or bounce off of. Go ahead and add a sphere shape to the collision object by right-clicking collision object, selecting add shape, select sphere. Uh, we're going to keep it relatively small. Set the diameter of that sphere to 10 pixels. All right, let's go ahead and add that label to the cursor game object. And then set the properties down in the property window to the following. Change the ID to cursor label. Set the X position to 120, and you can leave the Y position at zero. Change the color to whatever you like. I'm going to set it to a red. Ensure the pivot is set for center. And that should about complete it. Okay, lastly, let's add some Lua script to the cursor game object. Within the scripts repository over in the Project Explorer, add a new script and name that script file cursor. Go ahead and replace the default Lua code with the following. Input focus for the cursor is acquired within the init function. And the update function captures the cursor location each frame and echoes it within its own cursor label. Also, a set of instructions and debug messages are displayed on the screen. Within the on input function, the cursor location is updated as the machine cursor is moved around the game window. And when pressed or touched, the Create Crates factory is called to spawn a new crate at the current position. Finally, each time a crate is spawned, the crate count is incremented. And now within the outline window, go ahead and add the script as a component file to the cursor game object. All right, incremental build time. Please go ahead and save, and let's conduct a build.
Hey, let the games begin. All right, okay, it's not awe-inspiring, but we now have the ability to spawn a new crate at a user-selected position. And the crates are, in fact, affected by gravity, as well as any physical effects when they hit either a platform or the sides or the floor. You'll notice they bounce. Okay, we want to add a little pizzazz to all of our games and explosions is a simple way to do that. Every game's got some sort of explosion or things floating back and forth uh, as the various things happen. So in this, uh, we'll just show an example of that and then you can expand on that as you build your game. Uh, so in phase five, we're gonna build the explosion game object. Uh, actually, we're gonna spawn those. So we're gonna start with a game object prototype. Uh, that prototype will have a, um, a sprite with an image associated with it. That image will be associated with an animation group because we want that to kind of explode out and then kind of suck back in. Um, and then we'll also have a, a script associated with that. Uh, then we'll create the game object that hosts a factory, the factory pointing back to the prototype that we just, uh, we just built. And then we'll have build three at the end of that to verify functionality. Okay, this is a two-step process. The first step is to create the explosion prototype. Let's go ahead and do that. Uh, within the Project Explorer, add a new game object to the main folder. And let's set the ID to explosion prototype, since this will be a prototype for each of the explosions we're going to create. At this point, let's go ahead and add a sprite component. Uh, Right-click the game object in the outline panel. Go ahead and select Add Component, select Sprite. Uh, the image source for this will be our standard atlas, the Graphic Assets Atlas. And let's go ahead and set the default animation to the Explosion Animation Group. Our second step will be adding the Lua script to the Explosion prototype. Go ahead and in the uh, Scripts Repository folder over in the Project Explorer, let's go ahead and create a new script and change the name of that script to explosion. Let's go ahead and replace the default code with the following. The init function provides a debug print that an explosion has been initiated. And it also sends a message to the sprite component to start the play animation of the explosion animation group. When the onMessage function receives the animation done message back when the explosion animation is completed, it prints a debug statement advising us, and then it deletes this instance of the explosion game object. Lest we forget, let's add that script to our game object over in the outline window. Let's go ahead and uh, add the script component to the explosion prototype. Next, we're going to create the game object that actually spawns the explosions. With main collection and focus, go ahead to the outline window. Go ahead and right click collection. Let's add a new game object and change the ID of this game object to create explosion. Let's add a factory component to create explosion. And set the prototype down in the properties window to explosion prototype. That's what we had just created in the previous step. Now we have almost everything in place, but we need something that actually initiates that create explosion game object. And we're going to do that with the box script because the box script is what's actually monitoring the position of the box and then identifying when it hits the floor. So let's go back to the box script, bring it into focus. And we're going to add two lines of code as you see here. This will identify the current position of the box, and then it will call the factory that creates the actual explosion. We're ready for build three. Let's go ahead and save our project. Go ahead and build. Hey, we're almost starting to look like the beginnings of a real game. Well, maybe not quite, but uh, we're getting there. You should now be able to see how an animation can be initiated based on the impact of a collision object, AKA the crate hits the floor. It sets off the spawning of an explosion. That's a pretty common sequence of events in uh, many, many, many casual games. 
Okay, in the phase six, we're gonna extend the collision object thought process to have a shape that's not a sphere and not a box. And in this case, we're gonna create a triangle and we're gonna do that by creating a data file that's got the vertices of uh, that triangle. And then we'll add that in uh, to the collision object associated with a triangular crate and use that in lieu of a sphere or a box shape. The rest of this particular step, we're really going to do a carbon copy of what we did for the square crate, with the exception now that we have a, a different shape associated with it. At the end of this, uh, we're going to modify our uh, cursor so that uh, as it uh, clicks or as you touch the screen, it's going to start with a square crate. You click it again, it's going to flip over to a triangular one. You click it again, it'll flip over to a square and alternate between the two. And then we'll do build four, last build. Let's go ahead and begin the walkthrough of adding this convex shape to our uh, data project here. First, we need to create the data file that contains the vertices of that convex shape. So using a text editor, I've created a data file called triangle.convexshape. That's going to contain each of the XYZ vertices uh, in a table. And this is what that table looks like right here. Okay, now I'm going to place that data file within the main folder of our project. Additionally, we're going to need to add the image associated with that triangular crate. So let's go ahead and add the triangle1.png file to our images folder. And we also need to place that triangle.png file to the atlas. So let's do that now. The next step will be creating the prototype for that convex shape. So within the Project Explorer, under the main folder, go ahead and right-click main, select new, select game object, and let's go ahead and name this the triangle prototype. Go ahead and double click triangle prototype within the project explorer that'll bring it into focus. And now over in the outline window, we're gonna do three things. We're gonna add a sprite that would include the image of that game object. We're gonna add a script file that includes the same logic that we used for the square shaped crates. And then we're gonna add a collision object that's gonna use that triangle convex shape file to depict the shape. Let's go ahead and start with a sprite. Right-click Game Object within the Outline window and select the Add Component, and then select Sprite. Within the Property window, go ahead and select the Graphic Assets.Atlas as the source of our image and select Triangle as the default animation. Next, let's go ahead and add the Collision Object. Right-click Game Object within the Outline window, select Add Component, select Collision Object. By clicking the Collision Object, we now place focus on that component, can now add the Convex Shape file by selecting Collision Shape, clicking the ellipsis, and selecting Triangle.Convex Shape from the pop-up dialog box. Now, now that adds that set of vertices instead of your standard box or sphere. Lastly, let's go ahead and add the Lua script file to the game object. Within Project Explorer, go ahead and right-click Script Repository, select New, and go ahead and let's name that script the Triangle Script. As standard, let's go ahead and replace the default uh, template that uh, Default provides with the following Lua code. This is essentially the same as what we used for the Square Crate. And then we add that script to the triangle prototype. Next, we're going to create a game object that will host that new factory. We're going to call that Create Triangle Crates. With the main collection in focus, go ahead to the outline window, right click collection, select Add Game Object, and in the property window, rename it to Create Triangle Crates. Then right click Create Triangle Crate within the outline window and select Add Component and then select Factory. With the new factory object in focus, let's identify the triangle prototype as the prototype that we want to use.
The last step in this extension is to modify the cursor script, which we originally developed earlier, to generate both square crates as well as triangular shaped crates every time the user clicks the game. I've made the following changes to the cursor script. At this point, we change the cursor to extend it to support both square crates as well as triangle crates. Three script properties are declared. Self.shape defines the nature of the game object to be spawned next. And then there are two count variables, one for square, one for triangle. The update function stays the same. And within the onInput function of the cursor, we've now added a conditional statement which calls the factory associated with whatever the self.shape control variable indicates. Then it resets that control to the other shape, enabling alternating square versus triangular crates each time it's called. It's been a long path. Let's go ahead and conduct build four. Save the project, conduct a build. Let's try it. Go ahead and click or touch a location. You'll see that it initially spawns a square crate. Click it again. You're gonna see it alternating back and forth between square crates and triangular crates. Okay, we're getting there. You should now be able to see how an animation can be initiated based on the impact of a collision object and how that can set off the spawning of an explosion game object when it meets certain parameters. Well, you've reached the end of another one. Hey, uh, I think this one has been uh, helpful. I hope it has been. Um, we're now learning some of the complexities associated with a game that's got a little bit more realism associated with it. Uh, many games take advantage of the physics engine. Uh, characters are consistently bouncing off of each other or bouncing off of walls or being pulled in a certain direction. And now that you've learned how to apply that using a dynamic collision object for gravitational forces or for bouncing effects, uh, you got a good basis for, we'll expand on this in some of the follow-on game tutorials. They're going to be in a separate playlist. Um, as I indicated earlier, uh, there is a text version of this full tutorial. Uh, it's located at uh, tacticstudios.com. Please feel free to take a look at that and compare that with the video. Um, there is, uh, and here in the comments, I've put a uh, hot point a, a link uh, that goes to a shared folder. That'll provide you a zip file with all of the project files. It's got all the images, it's got the script files, it has the full project so that you can load that up on your machine, walk through it, tweak it a little bit so you get a little bit more comfortable with the techniques that we've applied here. If you haven't had a chance to yet, please subscribe. I would greatly appreciate that. And any comments you may have or any recommendations on how we can improve this, uh, that would be really helpful as well. Uh, most importantly, I really want to thank you. I hope that you're enjoying these tutorials. I hope they're useful to you. I'm going to continue to produce them. And uh, we now have two more to go in this introductory series. Hey, take care now. Looking forward to seeing you next time.